Hello, everyone. I am Julian Deutsch. I am Bloomberg's tech reporter based in Brussels. Um, and I'm so excited to be hosting this conversation with Nigel, talking about two of the coolest topics in tech right now, artificial intelligence and semiconductors. I want to remind you guys that you can send your questions, and I will see them popping up the screen. And I will be asking them throughout the conversation. But I've got a million conversation or questions for Nigel. Um, but I think first off, for people who are not familiar with GraphCore, can you explain what an IPU actually is? <laughs> <laughs> so um, GraphCore, we've created a new type of microprocessor to accelerate artificial intelligence. We call it the intelligence processor unit. It um, competes directly with NVIDIA and their GPUs. So we have, where they have CUDA software, we have something called Poplar. We have an IPU, they have a GPU. And to kind of put it in simple terms, or as simple as I can try, you know, if you have a CPU, it does one operation on one piece of data. A GPU will do one operation on multiple pieces of data. For example, paint all these pixels blue to create the sky. And an IPU will do multiple instructions on multiple pieces of data, which is ultimately what we need for AI. Because like our brain that has many neurons inside, there's lots of parallel operations that go on. Um, and those more complex data structures are what we actually need to uh, accelerate. Cool, so now that we know what IPU is, let's talk about chip wars. Because <laughs> that is obviously something that everyone's been very focused on, is this US-China trade war. Yeah. Where does GraphCore fit into this? So we're very much, um, I guess, just from our geography, we're obviously based here in the UK. Um, but we sit you know, very much under the umbrella, I guess, of US technology. And to the extent the US uh, government decides that there are export restrictions, that will typically catch us because we're using foundries like TSMC that rely on American technology. We rely on some pieces, small pieces of American technology inside our products, like the high-speed IOs and various pieces. So you sort of fall under. Um, a re-export of US technology. And so to the extent the US puts restrictions on shipping products into China, we would be caught by the same restrictions, even though we're a British company. And, and so how much of your sales are going to China? Um, at the moment, it's maybe 20%, 25%. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a significant market, and we've got some big um, internet companies there that we're working with very closely. And that's been really good for us because it really gives us insight into what's happening um, and how to get technology deployed in these very large um, companies. And I think my observation of it is that China is probably further ahead in trying to deploy um, AI in many cases. You know, I think the wake up moment for everybody was probably ChatGPT. Um, you know, back in December, when it suddenly struck the public consciousness that AI is a thing that's going to affect us all. Um, actually, in China, it was 2016. Hmm. It was AlphaGo. 240 million people watched AlphaGo beat Lee Sedol um, live on television, and then watched it beat the uh, Chinese Go champion um, as well. And so that was when AI kind of struck the public consciousness uh, in China. And, and kind of as a result of that, I think, China's been deploying AI more, and we probably see it directly in TikTok, you know, in the way that that creates this incredibly sticky environment that, you know, is, is really driving users. All of that's driven by AI technology. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, here, I'm based in Brussels, and obviously we're focused a lot on export controls and what the U.S. is doing to really curtail China's ability to advance in AI. But do you look at what's happening in China and say, oh, they're actually so much further ahead than we realized? I think they are, I've been going to China since late 1990s, I'm that old, um, and it's, it's amazing how much it's changed. It's unbelievable how much it's changed. You know, as one, as one person said to me, it's like a real country, you know, it has everything, you know, f and, and more, you know, in terms of fast trains and airports everywhere and, you know, just... I think if people don't go to China, they don't realize where it sits. Um, I think on you know, GDP, they say it's number two, but on um, adjusted uh, purchase power, it's ahead of the US in terms of economic power. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing 
we're seeing a conflict between two economic powers trying to um, battle over the future. And, and you talk about you know, going to China. We're obviously based here in the UK right now. Um, and Graphcore has been really um, known as one of the companies that's supposed to be the UK's real you know, answer to NVIDIA. Um, one of my favorite anecdotes is that for you know, every time you guys would reach a major milestone, you'd pop a bottle, not just any champagne, but Winston Churchill's favorite champagne. <laughs> um, it's a truly a British company. Um, but you know, fast forward four years, that was you know, something that was written about 2019. Um, fast forward four years later, and Graphcore is struggling, right? Well, you know, we are investing massively to build a technology, and we are competing head-to-head -head with probably, at the moment, one of the most successful companies in tech, you know, NVIDIA, you know, the first chip company to reach a trillion dollars in valuation. They're investing billions. This is, you know, this is their future. And what's stunning is that here we've got a company in the UK that is actually the closest in terms of from a technology point of view. Um, you know, customers tell us that clearly, you know, not just from a hardware point of view, but actually in terms of the software um, that we're delivering. You know, this is the easiest to use next to NVIDIA. And, and we're not perfect. I would say neither is NVIDIA. I'd give them a nine out of 10. Um, but we're probably a six or a seven and everybody else is like a three or a four. So, you know, that is a stunning position to be in. Um, compared to you know other big tech giants like an uh, Intel or an AMD or you know other big players, and so you know we've just got to invest to maintain that position and to grow. And and hardware is a bit like a, it's like a switch when the platform works and people can just use it with no friction, the, the sales just take off. Mm -hmm. So we, we've got to pile ahead to reach that point. But so, so why? Why are you not on track to be the next NVIDIA? Why are you not at one trillion? <laughs> <laughs> because, Why are they so Because this to technology is, it is so complicated. This is not like sitting down and making a microprocessor. This is like, you know, all of the complexity of what you're building here. You know, people do not program an IPU. People program in languages like PyTorch or TensorFlow or now JAX. Um, our software converts that very abstract description into huge number of parallel programs that run across this hugely parallel processor, run across hundreds of IPUs, all connected together in what we call a pod um, that delivers fast training or uh, inference. That conversion of that, you can write an image uh, recognition code in about 30 lines. And that translates into something that runs, you know, maybe for a month in a training program across hundreds of processors, each with thousands of processor cores um, inside them. And so that conversion is incredibly complicated. Um, you can get a, a, a benchmark that works, but actually making the technology so that you can just come and bring any code and it just works and it works at speed. That's an incredible challenge, and we're furthest down that path compared to anybody else. So would you say it's, it's mostly that customers find it, they're just used to NVIDIA, and that's why they're, they're constantly gravitating toward NVIDIA? Well, obviously, it's like the old IBM thing. Nobody got fired for using NVIDIA now, right? So um, it's the easy choice. We're still very much in the capability phase of AI, you know, in spite of all the wonderful things that have happened. You know, I describe it, ChatGPT, amazing. It's probably a bit like Pac-Man from a, from a gaming perspective. You know, it's color, it's pretty good, but it's, you know, it's nowhere near the three-dimensional interactive game environments that people have today. And that's where we're heading. Um, and and ChatGPT is just a minimum viable product. I do want to take a question from the audience. Um, someone asks, considering comments on the US and China, what is the appetite for GraphCore to expand in the EU? I think, you know, if we, UK, EU, we'd be under the same situation. You know, we'd probably have it easier um, if we moved to the US. It would probably be easier for us as a US company um, to operate. But, you know, we like to be... Why, why is that? Because of the amount of funding that's available in the US? Yeah, funding, um, you, you know, you, if you're going to need an export license, they're more likely to give it to an American company than they are to a European or a UK company. And, mm -hmm. you know, it's something we really need to think carefully about, I think, is Europe and the UK. Um, 
your funding would be easier. But, you know, the talent is here. It's a great environment. You know, talent's probably a little bit cheaper and more available than it is in Silicon Valley in particular. And, and the beer's good. <laughs> but the beer is really good in Brussels as well, I must say. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking about Brussels, I mean, obviously then, I focus a lot on regulation. And you're very interested in AI regulation. You're going to this UK Safety Summit next I week. Am, yeah. um, what is your message for governments who are looking to regulate AI? So I think there's a couple of things. I think it's, in AI, it's very analogous to the medical profession, where we've had the Hippocratic Oath for doctors to, you know, first do no harm. And we somehow have to engender in our AI developers this idea that this is a really powerful technology you're developing. Think carefully about what you're building. Think carefully about how it works. Think carefully about how you protect the people that are using it. And then on the other side of that, the companies who are deploying it, are they making it aware that you're using an AI system or that AI is built into this? Because as Alan Turing said, if you expect it to be intelligent, it's going to get the answer wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a probabilistic system. We're probabilistic animals, you know. Um, to err is human. And to err as a machine is probably even more possible um, because they're much less capable than our amazing brains. You know, your brain probably has 100 trillion parameters in it. ChatGPT's only got 100 billion. You're a 1,000 times better than ChatGPT. <laughs> Thank you, I want that in the headline. <laughs> But do you, do you think, though, when it comes to AI regulation, um, you know, you've got the likes of Sam Altman coming out and saying, please, governments, regulate us. D do you trust Sam Altman when he says that? I think you've got to be quite um, nervous when people throw their hands up and say, regulate me, regulate me, especially in an environment where governments are not in a position to actually understand um, the technology and, and we'll then look around and say, who can we turn to to actually help us write the regulation? Oh, Sam Altman, you know a bit, a little bit about this. <laughs> um, and, and we end up creating a situation where we, we cut back on innovation. You know, I think the open source large language models is gonna be really key um, in terms of creating an environment here where people can build on that technology. If they're closed source, if all you get is an API, that's gonna be a real problem for innovation. Mm -hmm. um, going forward because, you know, you, it's like a fundamental building block, like a database. It needs to be open and people need to be able to develop on top of it. It has to be open. Speaking of regulation, um, the EU's AI Act, there's going to be a massive meeting uh, tonight. I'll be up late covering that. But in the absence of, of mandatory rules for tech companies, have you guys self-regulated? Are there other uses of AI that you guys will not be part of? Well, we certainly look carefully at you know, what the end uses for our technology are, and we step back from certain things. At the end of the day, we sell picks and shovels, right? So in a gold rush, that maybe is a good strategy uh, to follow. So um, you cannot build something into the AI. You know, people, people say, oh, it's the AI at fault. It's not the AI. Don't blame the machine. There's nothing you can build into the hardware that will stop it doing bad things. Um, it's the developers who create something that maybe doesn't work properly or it's the people trying to exploit the technology who are using it um, in the wrong ways um, and are not making people aware of the risks and aren't protecting people from, from the problems. And there's no, where is the institution that we have, for example, in the medical profession or in the airline industry that is independent and trusted and that can solve for issues that come up after the fact. And there will be some issues after the fact. So I think that is going to be a key part of actually making this work, you know, having these independent institutions. And any economy, it only works if there is trust. You know, if you don't have central banks, if you don't have property law, you know, economies can't grow, can't scale. So it's actually in the commercial interests of all of these companies to have these trusted institutions that build trust in the system and allow innovation to foster and grow. Innovation, fostering this. Um, something that I focus a lot on Brussels, I hear lots of criticism of the EU not putting enough money into semiconductors. But I love this question from the audience. Um, do you feel as though the UK's current funding into the semiconductor and microelectronics industry is adequate? Uh, no. Pretty simple. <laughs> <laughs> A billion dollars over, or billion pounds over 10 years. Um, there's no way that's enough. And I sit on the board of uh, UKRI, which is, you know, the non-governmental body probably responsible 
for a lot of that funding. And the reality is there isn't the budget. Um, there isn't the budget available to do these things. And I think this is something that we really need to look at in the UK. Are we investing enough in our research and innovation? Because countries are like companies at the end of the day. You cannot just live on your past and on your history. You have to invest, you have to grow, you have to create new breakthroughs. And, and you have to do that um, to, to really foster growth in, in the economy. And, and we've been missing that for the last 10, 20 years. And what happens if the EU, if the UK, do not properly foster companies like Graphcore? Well, go look at China in the Qing dynasty, where they didn't adopt industrialization. They fell behind in the Industrial Revolution. And they, they admit their long century of humiliation was the result of that. You end up with you know, economic um, uncertainty. You end up with you know, global... Um, conflict that you know, will end up affecting you. You know, we risk as UK and Europe being left behind um, in this technology more. Where is our internet? Where are our internet giants? Where is where is our cloud computing giants? Um, I think you know this is a, a major issue for us. Our government, even our military, are dependent on foreign cloud computing giants. You don't need to park a battleship off the UK. You just turn off our internet. That is a spooky message to end on. <laughs> Thank you so much, Nigel. I appreciate it. I'm very curious to see what regulators uh, decide next, next week. Thank you. Thank you.